My first instrument was the guitar. I uh, grew up in Montana, so it was definitely a lot of country western music, and the Barbara Mandrell show was on TV, and I wanted to be Barbara. She was the big sister. She bossed everybody around. She had her own band, and um, yeah, so I started guitar in third grade. Public school music education was really, really important uh, in not just my musical upbringing, but my brothers as well. I have three younger brothers, and we all came up through the public school system. I did have some private guitar lessons, but I also um, played violin in fourth grade, realized I didn't like high squeaky things next to my ear, and then went on to piano, which I did some stuff at home. Uh, but the thing that really excited me was the vocal jazz ensemble from the middle school. They came to our elementary school and performed and I heard people singing solos. I saw a student band and everybody had fun and they had their own voice in the music and I wanted to be in the band. And it was because of that junior high choir director for me that really showed me or connected me with the music that was meant to be my life. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known about it. You know, I probably would have been chasing after Barbara Mandrell still, but you know, finding the bass and being able to play music with other students um, was really very important to me. And then going on to high school, had really great uh, band director for our jazz band and had a wonderful choir director that really challenged me, not just as a member of the choir, but in writing and arranging and having a leadership role in creating music at the school. Oh, just a few. <laughs> I mean, I'm forever indebted to Ray Brown. He changed my life. You know, he was the beginning of when I, you know, growing up in Montana, you know, you get thinking, well, it's really not a, um, it's probably not a stable decision <laughs> to say, I want to be a jazz musician, Mom and Dad. Uh, it's, that's nice, dear. Go get your music ed degree. And you know, for me, having my own doubts about not having a bass teacher until I was in graduate school, you know, I didn't really know if I was going to be able to follow my dreams. And to talk to Ray Brown about it and say, look, if I'm not good enough, tell me, and I will go do something else. But if I am good enough, show me where I need to go. And he was the first guy that really just, you know, as a pro player, to say, okay, kid, this is what you need to do, was very important to me. Um, Bert Turetsky was my bass teacher that actually, uh, you know, gave me technique. And then, of course, through that line, I studied with Jeff Hamilton because I wanted to know, you know, what does the drummer want that played with Ray for so many years? What does he want from a bass player? And then you can't study with, you know, Jeff without going to John Clayton for, you know, more learning and um, there's just so many mentors, you know, that open doors or, um, you know, it's, it's a great family. The first gig I was ever paid, jazz or otherwise. <laughs> I think the first gig I ever got paid for was in seventh grade for a wedding. I played classical guitar duets with my guitar teacher. I think that was probably the first one in seventh grade. And I don't remember how much it was. It might have been like 25 bucks or something. And I was like, oh, I can make money. And I, but you know, I, that even just the notion of making money didn't even hit me so much, except for like when I was in high school and I was on, I was playing electric bass in the pep band. And we went to, what was it, Great Falls, Montana for, you know, some girls division basketball tournament or something. And also later that year, we went to Missoula, Montana for the jazz festival, for jazz band. And I realized if I played music, I could go places. You know, you could travel. Um, you know, I never really thought about the money. I probably should have thought more about that, but it wasn't, it was more about being able to see other parts of the world and hear other people and um, things like that. K 
Kenny Barron. I would love to play with Kenny Barron. He's such an amazing piano player and one of my favorite recordings. I mean, I have, I think, just about everything he's ever done. Um, but one of my all-time favorites is Kenny Barron and Stan Getz, People Time. And just the whole notion of everybody, and it's consistent with how he, with the recordings that I have of his. It, it's never about um, him accompanying somebody. It's always about the conversation. And it's always this beautiful interplay of ideas and listening to each other and building. And I just think that would be such an amazing experience to be able to play with, with him. You know, it's been interesting. It hasn't come from the form of listening, though. Um, I've moved to Denmark because I got married, and now I'm in Denmark. And um, going through when you pack a lot of boxes <laughs> and you're unpacking things, I came across a book of Scarlatti sonatas. And I do not know what it is, if it's being in Scandinavia, if it was just the dark winter. But I've been, like, sitting at the piano and uh, playing them any better than I did when I was in sixth grade, but just for whatever reason, just the space of the single lines and thinking of the interplay and Scarlatti Sonatas. I mean, I never would have imagined that that was, I mean, it was torture as a kid. And now I just, I'll sit for a couple of hours and do things like that. Um, on my iPod, though, it seems that to be a lot of... Um, relatively new discoveries between, you know, the new marriage and things that my husband listens to and things that I've been digging into and, of course, checking out uh, the artists in Denmark and hearing what's going on in that part of the, the jazz family and being inspired by that as well.